So, uh, welcome, where the uh, topic of my talk will be high-density video transcoding for professional applications. So, a few words about ourselves. Uh, we called KeyPixo. KeyPixo is a spin-off of uh, Allegro DVT. So, Allegro DVT is famous for video compression. And uh, this is a core competency that we share with them. So we've been in business we're together with uh, Allegro DVT for about 12 years now. Uh, as KeyPixel, we offer OTT TV encoders, packagers, and also origin servers to provide OTT TV services to uh, broadcasters. Yeah. So uh, we launched the, our first um, real-time H.264 encoder in 2005. And soon after, the first uh, transcoder with MPEG-2 inputs and H.264 outputs. And those products were sold to um, uh, Tier 1, Tier 2 MSOs worldwide. And since then, we've always been working on video quality, improving the video quality and the video encoding density. So that will be the topic of my talk. Uh, five, about five years ago, we switched to a software model. So that is, we can supply the same functions uh, purely on software. This is what we call the Genova suite. So it includes live encoding, file-based transcoding, and packaging again. And here at NAB, we introduced our um, Ultra HD live encoder. So this is an appliance that takes SDI inputs and codes to HEVC in 4K, full frame rate, 60 frames per second, 10-bit HEVC, and that fits on a single uh, one IU server. This is purely in software, and uh, I think this is a I think this is a first. So, uh, a bit of context about my talk. This is what you see here: is the OTT delivery chain. So the live and VOD content is first compressed to different bit rates or different codecs, such as H.264, HEVC. Uh, then that content is repackaged. It is packaged to the, the formats needed for internet delivery, such as HLS, MPEG dash, uh, formats that travel the internet. Then uh, that output is delivered um, to the internet over the top or even to managed networks to connected devices. So what we supply at KeyPixel are the blue boxes. Yeah. In a bit more technical detail again, so the inputs would be single bitrate MPEG-2 or H.264. And the outputs are multi-bitrate H.264 or HEVC in different packaging formats, HLS, MPEG dash, HDS, smooth RTMP, so the many formats that internet requires, uh, suitable for live TV and uh, VOD. So the topic today will be uh, on that section only, the live encoding and how to improve it, both in uh, uh, density and uh, quality. All right, so here we are. Um, first question is, why do we need dense video transcoding? So we see uh, two reasons for that. Uh, first, there is the exploding video traffic. Some number, so within three years, the video traffic will grow to 90,000 petabytes. So one petabyte is one million gigabytes. Uh, Another one is that, uh, again, by 2019, more than 80% of the consumer internet traffic will be video traffic. And according to the same study, so a last striking number is that every second, one million minutes of video content will travel the network. The uh, second reason is the, is the, the uh, multiplication of screens. So uh, today, uh, viewers expect to view their content on a variety of screens, ranging from uh, smartphones to tablets, PCs, and even uh, 4K screens uh, at home, and over a variety of networks. So that means that they want to receive a high-quality video over 3G or LTE 4G. 
or um, even uh, the regular internet, whether this is Wi-Fi or a wires network. So uh, that means we have to address a um, growing number of client devices with different screen sizes, that is what we call multi-screen, and also at different bit rates, and this is what we call multi-rate. Multi-bit rate is to accommodate varying network conditions. So that means that there is clearly an exploding need for a video transcoding to uh, generate all those different resolutions and bit rates for multi-screen and multi-rate. So um, that's a simple example of uh, a video transcoding uh, configuration. You see that for a single uh, input service, which is in the example box here, for that single input, we will transcode it to four profiles in that example. And we will package it to uh, two formats, HLS and DASH, and with two DRMs. So that means for that single service, we have to perform encoding four times and we will deliver 16 output streams. Um, so again, this is just one example. It could be, it's four profiles. It could be two, it could be 10, it doesn't matter. And I think this is clear that there is a need for high density video transcoding. Ooh, messing with this. So how do we implement high density transcoding? Uh, the obvious answer is to use a uh, hardware encoding. So with traditional hardware-based encoders uh, on FPGA or ASICs, you have density. And you also have uh, a low power consumption. The drawbacks is that uh, it's not flexible at all. So with ASIC, you cannot change the codec. If you purchase an H.264 encoder and you want to switch to HEVC, you just have to uh, change your encoder, you remove it and you replace it with a new HEVC encoder. And then comes high dynamic range, HDR. You may have to change it again, depending on the HDR technology you will implement, you may have to change your HEVC encoder again. So uh, also the hardware encoders are not suitable to um, um, the implementation of streaming protocols such as MPEG Dash. They are better implemented in software. So there is no way you can implement that in a hardware encoder. That means with these solutions, you need two boxes. You need one box for encoding and another box for packaging. And also the, uh, the last line, the uh, close to last line, is that um, um, the uh, hardware-based encoders are obviously uh, specific platforms. You cannot reuse them. Uh, Net264 encoder is a Net264 encoder. Uh, if you uh, don't want to use that function anymore, you can dub the hardware. It's, it's not useful anymore. With um, traditional software-based video processing, the situation is exactly the opposite. You don't have density. Uh, you have a high power consumption, but you have flexibility. So this, this is easy to add new codecs in that scenario. You just change the code that runs on your CPU. You can start with H, H.264 and later add HEVC, add HDR without changing your hardware. You just update your software. Also, uh, within a software encoder, you can implement packaging, the packaging stage. That is, you can have in, in a single box, have uh, the video encoding and the packaging function in, in one, just one box. And very importantly, it runs on standard servers. So that means you can now buy software encoder from a vendor and uh, the hardware platform from another vendor. Uh, or you can buy the software encoder from a vendor and just use that on your existing hardware platforms. Or, or again, when you don't need that function anymore, you can just remove the software and recycle your hardware platforms. So that's an important uh, feature to support. What we propose here is a software-based, what we call software-based high-density video processing. So basically, this is the best of both worlds, high-density, low power consumption, and flexibility. 
So to understand, we have to go a bit further into technical details again. Um, that slide shows a video transcoder architecture. Yeah. So uh, the input stream is demultiplexed to separate the different components, subtitles, audio tracks, video streams. Then the audio is decoded and re-encoded to the format you need for the output. The subtitles are converted to the formats you need again, such as closed caption, DVB subtitle, DVB teletext, ACT27, WebVTT, TTML. There are many, many different uh, subtitling formats to support. About video, this is decoded and then pre-processed. So in that pre-processing -pre stage, uh, we uh, resize the video to the different uh, frame sizes you need for your multi-bit rate encoding. You can do the interlacing, you can do many different pre-processing functions such as denoising, frame rate doubling, and so on. Then that uh, pre-processed video is then uh, encoded. So encoded fits in those two boxes. Um, there, are, there are functions such, such as uh, motion compensation, intra-prediction, entropy encoding, and other functions that lie in the control box, uh, such as red control, a very important one, obviously, with look ahead, uh, scene change detection, frame field detection, mode decision, picture decision, keyframe alignment, uh, so many things to implement in the uh, control layer. So once the video and the audio is, are encoded and the subtitles converted, you will multiplex that together, actually package it in, a, uh, in an OTT language uh, to the formats such as HLS and Dash that are needed for internet delivery. So packaging is also the, uh, um, the stage where you add encryption, add signaling, and you handle fragmentation and uh, syn synchronization of the different profiles. So that's the broad picture of the uh, video transcoder. So how do we uh, improve that? Um, as we saw in the former table, we could implement that purely in hardware. So we saw that it's not good for flexibility. In hardware, for instance, you cannot implement at all the packaging box that lies at the uh, bottom right. Or you can implement purely in software but then you don't have density and uh, you have a high power consumption. Or you can implement a mix. And so this is what we call the high density video processing. Actually, the trick is to use hardware only for select function and use software for the rest. So uh, going back to my diagram, For packaging, um, this, uh, it has clearly to be implemented in software because you need flexibility. Packaging always changes. You need to implement new protocols, new, new uh, uh, subtitling modes, uh, new ad uh, system, new DRM vendors. So that's why it has to be in software. There is no question about that. That video encoding part has to be implemented in hardware for maximizing the speed and the, uh, and so the density of your video encoder. So why that part? Because um, what you see here, motion compensation, intra-prediction or entropy encoding are normalized parts of the codec. That means the codec specifies exactly what those functions should, uh, should do. So uh, the, the, um, we don't have two ways to implement entropy encoding, for instance. Entropy encoding is entropy encoding, and every encoder will implement it the same way. So that's why you have to use hardware for that. This is a fixed function. It has to be efficient. It doesn't change. As for the uh, two remaining boxes, um, well, you have to make a decision. So for those different functions, you have to select which functions, fun functions you want to, to implement in software and which functions you, will, you want to implement in the hardware. So here, uh, encoder vendors have to make a decision. And actually, this one is the, uh, the key slide of my uh, presentation. That is, the functions you select to be implemented in software and hardware and the way you implement them 
will be the key differentiator for the different encoders. So that will configure the uh, video quality you get from your encoder and the uh, encoding density you get. So every encoder vendor, including ourselves, have their own secret sauce for that. So they, they won't tell uh, what they do in, uh, in those two boxes. Uh, but this is really where the, uh, the magic happens. To um, implement that hybrid encoder, we use uh, Intel's QuickSync. So Intel QuickSync video, QSV, QuickSync video, uh, provides hardware acceleration for video encoding as well as decoding. And it's available on some, uh, on many actually, Intel i7 and Xeon E3 processors. So that is one Intel processor with QuickSync. Here you see there are four uh, computing cores, four CPU cores. And there is an area that is reserved for processor graphics for video encoding and decoding. That architecture was first introduced uh, five years ago, and that was introduced to address the consumer market. So that's interesting because it was originally designed to handle, for instance, video conferencing or, uh, or just uh, video playback. Um, that's uh, an Intel diagram of what functions they implement in the red part. So you can recognize some uh, words we mentioned before. That is, they implement, for instance, entropy encoding, uh, intra-prediction, motion compensation, and some other functions. So uh, QuickSync is, uh, is still uh, changing, evolving over time. So, uh, for uh, Intel tries to have a better video quality, uh, higher processing throughput, so that means encoding speed, and that also means the number of services you can encode on each CPU. And also, uh, they add support for new codecs. So again, QuickSync video is targeted at consumer applications. To use it for professional applications, we need to design uh, custom packages. So what's wrong with uh, using a consumer technology for professional applications? So first, the most important point to us is to fix the video quality. So you have to ensure that the video quality uh, will be suitable to the professional applications you require. That means you have to not use quick sync video encoding as a monolithic block uh, out of the box. You have to change it. And the way to change it is to carefully select which functions shall run on the QuickSync hardware parts, the red block you saw, and which other functions you, you want to override. And when you override them, you need to re-implement them in software. So that choice and the way you re-implement them is what will make a good encoder or a bad video encoder. Also, you have to address the feature set. So that means you have to add all the features that uh, are missing in QuickSync, such as keyframe alignment for multi-rate encoding, uh, subtitling management, multi-machine-based encoding, uh, among a few, um, OTT packaging, obviously. So multi-machine-based encoding is a way to encode the same service across different uh, servers. Some of these functions are very complex to implement because they may need you to reprocess the already compressed output. And third, if you are in charge of selecting the hardware platform to implement those functions, you have to ensure that this platform is uh, reliable, that is uh, for 24-7 um, uh, operation, as we need in the broadcast world. You have to select the right Intel SKUs that are suitable for 24-7 operation at full processing power. That means CPUs that are meant to run 24-7 at full load. So um, at Kipixo, the uh, software, the, our encoding software is called Genova Live. And the Genova Live Speed version is the one that takes advantage of QuickSync uh, encoding. So as one implementation example, we can run on uh, that platform, which is from uh, Contron. This is called a SimCloud. 
So this is a 2U chassis that includes 18 uh, CPUs. And each of those CPUs uh, includes the uh, Intel QuickSync acceleration. So on that platform, as an example, we can uh, transcode up to 144 HD H.264 services in just to you. So that's how we solve density and we keep the broadcast quality. So again, uh, that platform is an example. Other examples include HP Moonshot, uh, Supermicro Microblade as a version with QuickSync. Uh, Intel also designed their own PCI boards that's called Intel VCA. Artisan is also a supplier, potential supplier, and uh, probably many others. So what do we get with that? Um, on, for instance, an i7, uh, that i7 processor, we can encode eight um, services. So if you see the eight in that table, eight services to 720. So what that table means is that from HD input, tiny t, i15 in that case, we can encode eight services, eight such input services, each to 1280 by 720. So that means if we multiply by 18, you get that's how you get 144 services in um, in that uh, chassis. As another example, you could encode the HD input to four profiles ranging from uh, 1080 down to sub VGA, and you get four services per CPU. That means 72 services in two years. So here with quick sync acceleration on that CPU with that blood server with our software. This is the numbers you get. You can it ranges from 36 uh, multi-rate services per RU on average to 72 uh, HD services per RU. And the power consumption varies from 7 to uh, 14 watts. This is to be compared with a pure software encoding. So without QuickSync on a regular 1U server, what you will get is the following number. You, instead of um, 72 services, you will get set 7 per U. Uh, and instead of 36, you will get 2. So, and uh, the power consumption is also very different. So in those configurations, on those examples, we multiply the density by 13 and divide the power consumption by 7 and we keep the video quality. So, um, well, the conclusions of this are um, for best video transcoding quality and density at lowest power, uh, you require a balanced approach between a hardware acceleration and software control. The latest high density transcoding technologies, namely Intel QuickSync Video, are now suitable for professional transcoding applications. And that is important because they were originally designed for consumer applications. But to do this, you need to design proper software packages to override the critical functions to, to ensure the video quality and to add the missing features that are needed for uh, the professional markets. Uh, thank you. So I can take questions. So this is not connected to uh, digital access. Uh, this is not your output is not going to mobile phones or the lot. It's going between corporate offices or you said it's professional services. That yes. I can't hear you well, actually. Professional services yes. and identity. Yes. And, and so what was at the beginning? Sorry. So the question is, is it where's the, uh, where's the end, where's the sync for your data going? Is it to users, consumers, or is it to no. another service? Uh, no, I mean, the, the service is intended to be delivered to the consumers. Yes, indeed. But, um, um, but the encoder is meant for professionals. That is, if you're a professional, like you're a telco or a cable co, you want to uh, transcode your existing TV services 
to OTT uh, services, you want to do that in a professional way. So you want to ensure that your viewers, your consumer, will have the best video quality. And so the message is that you can use a consumer technology for that, but you need to change it a bit. Okay, well, thank you.